مساء الخير جميعا اتمنى ان حضراتكم تكونوا سامعيني كويس وشايفين البرزنتيشن ريزونابلي ويل انا هكلم حضراتكم النهارده عن الاي سي دي انديكيشنز وهنستخدم كيس بيزد ابروتش والحقيقه الكيس بيزد ابروتش ده بيزد على بيزد على دوكيومنت that was published um, quite some time ago to 2013. Uh, the document uh, uh, address um, category of patients where there are gaps in evidence. So these patients were not enro enrolled in clinical studies and you might not find exactly uh, the answer if you look in, uh, in, in the published evidence or in the guidelines. ومن هنا أهمية ال ال manuscript ده. الحقيقة ال manuscript ده بيعزي أهمية وبيؤكد على أهمية ال clinical judgment. وقد إيه أنت ممكن تلاقي variety of patients or variety of clinical scenarios ما ينطبقش عليها ال standard guidelines. فا I I highly encourage you to to look this paper up and read it. Again, this was addressing real world clinical scenarios that are not addressed in clinical studies. Can can be a door how the consensus document that on the indication بتاع ال ICD implantation. وده تم إزاي تم عن طريق many experts. Where each expert would score the indication a score. Um, out of, uh, of of nine, so from one to nine, and then we they take an, they took an average, and when the score was ranging from seven to nine, it was an appropriate indication for an ICD. When it was from four to six, it was labeled as maybe appropriate for an ICD indication, and when it was from one to three, it's uh, it's labeled as rarely appropriate for a CRT indication, for an ICD indication. And we will start off with some clinical scenarios that cover ICD indication as a secondary prevention. So this first case is a 56-year-old gentleman who presented with an anterior wall myocardial infarction and developed ventricular fibrillation within the first 24 hours from the onset of his chest pain. His ejection fraction was 30% and his coronary angio showed multi-vessel disease with poor dester runoff that was thought not to be amenable for intervention. Uh, he is about to be discharged on medical treatment and you were consulted about his candidacy for an ICD prior to discharge. And the question is, what would be your decision? Whether would, would you go for an ICD or refrain from putting in an ICD or reassess his ejection fraction after a month. It's very important that uh, I mention here is that this talk is better uh, be interactive. It will really um, magnify the benefit out of it. So if you have any input, feel free to unmute yourself and let me know, or you write it in the chat if you wish. And we would also appreciate the input of Dr. Ahmed. Uh, what would he do in this clinical scenario? So let me point out first, what's the classic approach? So the classic approach, when you face a patient who develop a VF arrest in the initial 48 hours of an acute myocardial event, this is labeled as primary ventricular fibrillation and most likely we do not react for, for it and we do not put an ICD. So we could do not consider this a classic indication for an ICD. And what we usually do is that we do assess the rejection fraction in 40 days or three months, according to what they have been done, uh, like revascularization or not, and whether the rejection fraction remains low or not. If it remains low, we put in an ICD. If not, we don't. So the question now, is there anything different in this clinical scenario that might make you change your opinion? So I see here in the chat that um, someone would go for an ICD. Dr. Muhammad Nabil would, would go for an ICD. Um, ICD as we did not correct the etiology. 
So would you like to give us uh, your uh, input, sure. Dr. Ahmed? So we, we know that uh, we think that this EF, uh, it was an EF uh, was probably related to his uh, acute uh, myocardial injury. And uh, that we correctly, somebody said that he did not correct the etiology because he has multi-vessel disease and he's not going to have a prevention. So he has a, a significant ischemic origin. So he's, this, this VFRS is an ischemic etiology, more than an established, scar related UT type of etiology. We, the reason this patient is interesting is because he has a myopathy already, his EF is low. We don't expect the EF to improve too much um, because it's going to do an intervention for any potential aggregating myocardium. And what we probably end up with is an established uh, myopathy who will be treated maximally for his coronary artery disease. And I think he will remain at risk for sudden cardiac death on follow up. Uh, with a 56 year old man, uh, I would really err on the side of safety. Now, we have an extra option here that I don't think is available live vest. So the live vest is a great bridge to, uh, for uh, when available, because that's a wearable external defibrillator that allows you to uh, maximize therapy, reassess the patient on the outpatient setting for a primary prevention indication. Because this EF does not constitute a, uh, this is a, reasonable uh, etiology for an ischemic event that we just had. And uh, in, in those situations, we want to assess him functionally and prognosis-wise as outpatient and decide on the definitive. When we don't have a life test in a guy like him, I would really maximize the beta block therapy, the afternoon reduction, the anti-ischemics, the therapy, and I would probably err on offering him a definitive earlier rather than later. So it's not what the, you know, the general guidelines tell you, but I would really be very concerned with that long term. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Osman uh, agrees that uh, given the fact that this patient etiology has not been fixed and cannot be fixed, we probably would err on the side of caution. And this is the opinion of most of the experts who uh, heard this scenario. So this is how you would deal with um, a VF or a hemodynamically unstable ventricular tachycardia that is labeled as being primary. So occurring within the initial 48 hours. And so two main factors would, would dictate what you would do. Number one, whether revascularization has been achieved or not. And number two is the left ventricular ejection fraction. So if you have a patient whose left ventricular ejection fraction is poor, so less than 35%, and he has not been revascularized or can, cannot be revascularized, that would make you agree that um, this is an appropriate therapy. So this patient, according to the score of this uh, experts, took seven. So the seven is, makes him an appropriate candidate for an ICD implantation um, because of the fact that he has two major risk factors, the ischemic burden as well as the impaired ejection fraction. So uh, when, if, if you revascularize if you, if, and, or if the ejection fraction is higher, the decision might be a little bit different, okay? So the second clinical scenario is of a 64 years old gentleman who is known to have ischemic heart disease, multivessel disease not amenable for revascularization, controlled or medical treatment. He presented to the OPD after an episode of unheralded syncope. His ejection fraction was 45%. He has apical septal and inferior wall hypokinesis. An EP study was performed and it failed to induce any ventricular arrhythmia. And the question is, what would you do next? Would you reassure or would you implant an ICD? So again, we'd go to the basics. This is kind of a must type patient, must have a major clinical study. Um, and this patient has sort of a mid range ejection fraction and the right way to deal with this kind of patient when he presents with syncope 
is to get him to the EP lab. If you induce the sustained monomorphic VT, that would be a clear cut indication for an ICD. But if not, like our patient, the question is, what would you do? So the bottom line is, do you think your patient here is safe enough that you cannot offer him or can, can keep him without an ICD? Or does he need backup for prevention of sudden cardiac death? Mind you, EP study in patients with ischemic heart disease has a fairly reasonable negative predictive value. So if it's negative, probably this is okay. You're pretty confident that this is okay. So let's have a look at what the consensus document said. So again, two important factors would um, dictate what you do in this particular patient. His presenting complaint and his ejection fraction. So you see when this patient had a syncope on a baseline coronary artery disease and no acute event different from the previous patient, and he had an ejection fraction that was preserved, so more than 50%. The, the, he scored two and three on the consensus document, depending on whether um, the EP study was positive or negative. So that means that when you have a preserved ejection fraction, your patient is probably safe, and this would be a rare indication for an ICD. But when you look at our patient here, so a patient who had an unexplained syncope, coronary artery disease, no acute event, but ejection fraction that is in the mid-range. The, if, if the EP study revealed inducible ventricular arrhythmia, so that was a clear-cut indication. So everyone thinks that this is an appropriate indication for an ICD. But our patient would qualify for the may be appropriate. So there is a great um, percentage of experts who would think that even if the EP study is negative, this patient might need an ICD, which is kind of a paradox. I don't so, uh, know what's your opinion on it, right. Dr. So, so if you look at the mean of the must way back, the negative uh, value of the te of EP testing is not perfect. So if you follow the patients, the mean of the must patient for three years, the incidence of the uh, particular arrhythmia was actually 23 percent, so it's not zero. Um, but this is in the patient population with an ejection fraction less than 30 percent. So the question is, patients who have scar from a prior myocardial injury, myocardial infarct, have a substrate for ventricular tachycardia, and even if the EF is 50 percent, there is a certain risk for ventricular tachycardia. Uh, so it's not zero. So in other words, our guidelines with the injection fraction are far from ideal, unfortunately, because even with a high EF and if you have scar, you are still at this particular area. So we are in a conundrum here because we cannot offer everybody the liberty. So that's where we have to rely on testing in those, in this mid-range population, which I think is very appropriate. And I would actually not rush with the defibrillation in the patient like this. Um, what, I, what we have again access to is long term monitoring. And an implantable loop recorder would be very ideal in this patient. But of course, I would also look at other etiologies for his syncope because it may be totally aggravated, maybe a prostatic or greater. So, in this case, I would say that's rarely appropriate to, to implant the defibrillation. Yeah, well, which uh, it's. Uh, the same as, you know, it's a split, it's a tie kind of a thing between people who would go for an ICD and people who won't. Okay. So the next clinical scenario is of a 57 year old female patient with severe mitral regurgitation due to mitral valve. Uh, CV, I think it's degenerative mitral valve, as far as I remember. Her coronary angio prior to the valve replacement was normal. She underwent mitral valve replacement with a mechanical prosthetic valve. 
And in the first post-operative day, she was resuscitated from a VF arrest. Her echo showed a well-functioning prosthetic valve, a mildly dilated ventricle of an injection fraction of 48%. You were consulted about her candidacy for an ICD. Would you reassure, would you, do, would you put in an ICD or would you uh, do an EP study? So this is a patient with no clear reversible etiology. Um, one day after a mitral valve replacement for severe mitral regurgitation and her ejection fraction is sort of a borderline. So let's see what, uh, what uh, these uh, guys think. Curious to see what you guys here think. What do you think? Anybody volunteers? Go through the that's correct, but this is a little unusual in the fact that it was the next day from a valve replacement. There must be something that caused it here, a small embolus, uh, microembolic event, coronary embolus, uh, something that caused this to happen. Who's on day one? This is not an established stable patient who just develops uh, the FRS. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we need to kind of watch this baby. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure that we can say it's non revert It's, you know, a permanent risk for her. I think the risk, this event is probably related to a perioperative event of some sort. But, but, but if there wasn't, like if, if it's just this mild impairment of the ejection fraction after severe mitral valve disease. You, you almost expect a lower ejection fraction after replacement of a mitral valve in severe amount. Right. Because you're already relieving this very large, you know, after load, uh, you know, from the front. I'm uh, sorry, you know, the volumes are you're really affecting the dynamic. So it's very common to see that there was already a post of a mitral valve disease. I think it's the EF has nothing to do with it. I think this was a, uh, a Maybe some pacing from the temporary pacer wire they have uh, that induce some arrhythmia. Maybe it's a you know, small embolic coronary event, uh, air. Uh, this is very often. I mean, these patients are really, you know, not so you, for you, long term. You would wait. You, uh, you, you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Our treatment medically, beta blockers are a great anti arrhythmic, sudden death preventive. Intervention. I don't know that this patient deserves uh, or needs or would benefit from it. <clears throat> would you prolong her hospital stay? This is day one. How many days would you make it? It's like five days. Yeah, I would keep her, you know, five, six days. I would definitely keep her, you know, monitor, continue to monitor treatment medically. I don't know that she's at risk for return. All right. Okay. Would you put a loop? Yes, I would, we can put a loop, although. Yeah, I mean, the loop is a very innocuous intervention. The loop is just a two-minute procedure and uh, gives you three years of monitoring. Right. Uh, but I, I think this is this is not a, 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 a an unknown etiology to high risk of recurrence type of event. So again, this was a tie between experts, right? So if you have severe valvular disease, with a lethal ventricular arrhythmia within the first, with the first 48 hours um, from the surgery, um, they labeled it as maybe appropriate indication uh, for an ICD. So everybody has his you know, own preferences and that stuff. All right. Uh, case number four is a 24-year-old female presented with recurrent. Oh, why it's doing this? Uh, presented with recurrent sudden syncope, uh, followed by complete recovery. Her, eject, her EF was normal. Echo in general was normal. Her uh, there was no family history of sudden sudden death. Uh, 
her ECG is shown below. I will show it to you in a second. And the question is, what is your next step? Would you reassure? Would you give beta blockers or would you put in an ICD? So this ECG is meant to show uh, long QT. You can measure it uh, at your uh, leisure, uh, but it's, it's meant to show long QT. And the question is, what would you do first for a patient who presented with syncope and she, um, she has a long QT? So what's the classic teaching? What's beta blockers? All right. So, <laughs> so I guess. Yeah. No, no, no documented ventricular arrhythmias. You start beta block. I would start beta block. Strange enough, this document was kind of liberal in implanting an ICD. So when there is an unexplained syncope. Um, with long QT, um, everybody agrees that this is an appropriate behavior to put in an ICD with different, you know, degrees. So uh, uh, everybody agrees when it's uh, happening on beta blockers, um, and most agree even without beta blockers. What we usually do in our practice is start off beta blockers first and see what happens. Okay. I don't think so. Increases it. So, when you get in, in, in the store. In this case, how are you going to do it? Huh? So, you have to really extend the detection time to make sure you don't shock her right away because she's actually had, she's done well and she's been, she's up to 24 years of age. So, uh, I worry about even younger and presenting earlier with, with lots of the best thing to do. You know, I think we do. Uh, we have a question here where, from uh, the the chat function of Zoom, uh, Dr. Ahmed Yusuf is asking why they go for an ICD uh, before beta blockers. Um, I'm not 100% yeah. sure we can read more into the, the paper, uh, but uh, the practice of Dr. Osman here and our practice in our institution is to start beta blocker first and see uh, what the patient does. Did, did, you, um, uh, did she do any genetic testing? I don't think so. Okay, so, yeah. so maybe you know there's room to risk stratify long QT syndrome. So long QT3, for instance, is a much higher risk of, of cell death and it doesn't respond to better block. But it's and QT3, you might be more aggressive in the defibrillator early on. Um, so that, that may be added to the management situation. Right. So, Dr. Osman, would you do regular? Uh, exercise stress test for these patients to make sure that they are well beta blocked or not? So type one is exercise issues. Type two is more at rest while sleeping with loud noises and things like that. So again, I think the genetic uh, evaluation is really more valuable than just the stress test. So type one, you definitely want to use a lot of beta blockers. Yes. Perfect. Okay, our next question clinical scenario is of a 37 year old gentleman with DCM. He presented with sustained monomorphic VT. His ejection fraction was 40%. He had an EP study where the tachycardia was proven to be bundle branch reentrant ventricular tachycardia. And the right bundle was successfully ablated with non-inducibility of the tachycardia afterwards. So the question is, would you reassure now since you ablated his tachycardia or would you put in an ICD? So that's kind of a very particular clinical scenario. If anyone would like to give us his input, either through Zoom or here on the floor, feel free. Well, the patient here is the TDO. Like in, in any context, the yes, it was proven. I at least assume that. 
satisfaction is now 40%. Uh, it's not a case for the primary prevention actually anymore. Yeah. Uh, now this problem of the young, etc. What is the debate on the Yeah. Still one one missing piece of the puzzle, right? It, it's well known that these group of patients would have in the future other forms of ventricular arrhythmias. So that's the point. Would you put an ICD in or would you wait? And let's see how the expert would do. So for a, for a sustained monomorphic VT and structural heart disease, for most patients, this is an appropriate indication for an ICD, right? Um, bundle branch re-entry that is successfully ablated in a patient with cardiomyopathy. Most people, if the ejection fraction is less than 50, would put in an ICD. If the ejection fraction is more than 50, it's a maybe appropriate indication. And that's because of the fact that these patients might develop down the road and other forms of ventricular arrhythmias. Would you like to comment? The yes, I, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's really appropriate to do it when you have a, a definite uh, diagnosis with a huge ventricular arrhythmia. This is an idiopathic cardiomyopathy uh, related, but idiopathic uh, PT that's ablatable. I don't think there's, uh, I would be uh, on the lower score side. I think in the United States today, this implant will not be approved. Oh, is that right? That's true. Okay. Because the gap is 20%. There is no indication for primary prevention. Uh, if you're not going to ablate it, at least, and you, or you don't think that you ablated this ventricular tachycardia, then you have a room to say that this is secondary prevention. But today, this patient is not getting the in the United States. My only problem with this approach is the low negative predictive value of an EP study in a DCM patient. That's no, the problem. Of course. Right? You diagnose one the branch the and you are it, and you could not induce it again and there. That's, 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 so it's almost treated as a uh, idiopathic DT that you are intervening upon. Right. So it's almost like a RDOT DT that you are late and you don't have any patients. Do you think MRI would carry any role in risk stratification of the patient Absolutely. like this? I wish I could do MRIs on every patient that we see and assess the star burden on MRI and come up with a uh, much more uh, uh, appropriate way of risk stratifying patients, whether it's skin or not skin. Actually, it's, it, you could use that instead of the EF. Yeah, I would love to use MRI for everybody. We don't have that capability. All right, I, I must say that in my practice, um, I, I would put an ICD in for this patient. Uh, I, I realize the limitations and everything, but this is what I'm trying to, uh, the message that I'm trying to deliver, to deliver is that there are many clinical scenarios Absolutely. where people would you know, disagree on and the practice might be different just because the, the fact that in these group of patients, we do not have solid data. And now we're, uh, we're shifting gear to uh, primary prevention indications. So uh, uh, this clinical scenario is of a 45-year-old gentleman who is hypertensive. Oh, sorry. Who is hypertensive and smoker. He presented with an anterior wall myocardial infarction. He had primary PCI to his LED, and his ejection fraction dropped to 30 so what would you do next? I, th I think this is a clear indication. Would you reassure, repeat the echo in three months or 40 days, or do an EP study, put in an ICD? I think people, people would agree that we would wait a while and then reassess his ejection fraction, see if it's still impaired or not. So the question is, this patient was transferred to a step-down unit and he was planned to be discharged with a wearable life vest when he started to develop frequent non-sustained VT on telemetry. So now, would that affect your management? 
pour notre effectivement. How many days after uh, the March? Four, five days. Okay. It, it wouldn't affect my management. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, everybody agrees on this. Okay. Still, this patient um, uh, has no clear indication for putting in an ICD. But don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that he is not at risk. He is actually at a higher risk than before developing his uh, ICD, uh, the, his non-sustained VT. The point is, up till now, we do not have data that this these patients would benefit from putting in uh, an ICD. So this patient, and he's going home with a wearing, and he's uh, yes. So that's a, a very important uh, point. What if you do not have a, a, a wearable vest? Would that change your management? Because obviously we do not have wearable vests here. Uh, Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I think this uh, we we all agree that this cannot be done. But you know what? I think this will not change the his prognosis because he would still develop ventricular arrhythmias in a ward or in a step down unit. And he would probably get prolonged cardiac arrest before he is being resuscitated, which will seriously affect his CNS. So personally, from more than one occasion, if, if I have a patient with um, really impaired dejection fraction, uh, evidence of ventricular arrhythmias of any sort, uh, a poor Killip class at presentation, uh, I, I would put in an ICD just because of the fact that we do not have a wearable vest. And I appreciate that this is perhaps um, not the optimal thing to be done, but uh, it's it's a way around things. Can, can you give us uh, your input? Uh, the, the, the conventional way is letting them uh, recover from their acute uh, myocardial infarct and intervention. And we have the, the, the dynamite study that shows that you, you know, putting in a defibrillator in the first uh, 40 days, as uh, Dr. Emmanuel was saying, has a high risk of mortality than that not. So it, it's, it's a tricky situation when you really feel that uh, he's having uh, frequent ventricular activity two days after the acute event. That's kind of a marker of a high risk. So you're right, it's, high, it's a high risk patient. And if you don't have any other way of protecting him, I think. From practical, from the practical standpoint, I think it is a related to what could save his life. Um, it's, uh, again, this would not be approved. Oh, this certainly Canada would Canada, not be approved. Yeah, and uh, he would definitely go home with his life vest for uh, for forty days or six weeks, and assess his death again about it. I guess we are talking about a uh, you know different country, different oh. resources, different setup. Uh, but I just wanted to point it. That to this uh, group of patients because I, 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 I honestly recently lost a patient with this well, clinical well, scenario. Well, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's exactly what the, actually the, you talk to the, the console who makes the life best. That's when they push out. They push out that, oh, you see, these patients that go home on beta blockers that die a few weeks after an MR. And that's, that's true. That is exactly true. The guidelines are just that, the guidelines. We still have to uh, have a clinical judgment on each individual patient and assess uh, what, uh, what the situation is for that specific patient and sometimes bend, bend the guidelines a little bit one way or the other. Yeah. So, do you think that the dynamite and the cabbage patch, you know, could, like with development of new data, could change down the road to address this group of high risk patients? Uh, post MI, like I'm not talking about an ejection fraction of 40 or 45. Yeah. I'm talking about really low ejection fraction with some criteria of an arrhythmic, uh, you know, uh, absolutely, absolutely. risk. Uh, but it, it's a good, um, so it, it's a, we have very good lessons from both of those two studies. So cabbage patch, pulmonary vascularization is your best anti arrhythmic if you have coronary disease and a skin and a skin burden, stabilizing the myocardium by reperfusion and revascularization is a great tool 
to prevent ventricular death. So I think we need to keep that in mind. We don't want to be uh, doing things that would still keep that skin burden alive and well and, and potentially cause the FRS on the, the, the defibrillator. We stop shocking you after six six shocks, right? Right. So you, if you have very bad skin burden, you still are going into the F and the F, you will die, even though you have a defibrillator. So let's not forget the, the plumbing that follows. Yeah, the revascularization, very important. Likewise, and after an acute MRI, the patient may be unstable hemodynamically. The procedure of replacing the device that is supposedly an elective procedure may be at a higher risk procedure. So you end up adding morbidity and mortality if you intervene too soon after an attack. So there are lessons from all of this, uh, from these two negative trials, right? Uh, but I think we, we sometimes have to assess the patient. So uh, the next scenario is of a 39-year-old gentleman who is diabetic and smoker. He presented with an extensive, extensive anterior wall myocardial infarction. He had a primary PCI uh, for a very proximal LED lesion. And after the procedure, he developed complete heart block that persisted. His EF dropped to 30%. And the question is, what would you do next? Reassure. You repeat the echo in three months, you put in a pacemaker, you put in an ICD. So the only different thing from the previous clinical scenario is that this patient developed complete heart block. Would that change your management? So you, you, you were voting for waiting for three months. Can you wait now? Okay. okay. CRT defibrillator, okay. Right. Yeah. So the rationale behind this is that you, you don't want to put in a pacemaker and the ejection fraction remain impaired. So you have to redo a procedure with the risk of infection, with a new lead and everything, right? So that's why if you have to put in something, which is a pacemaker in this patient, you might as well put the full meal deal, right? So I guess everyone agreed on this and I'll show you uh, the consensus on this one. So if there is a need for a guideline-directed pacemaker therapy post-MI, less than 40 days, and the ejection fraction is less than 35%, everyone agrees that it's appropriate to put in an ICD. When it's ranging from 36 to 40, I guess some thought that there might be a chance for recovery, and this patient will probably need, in, uh, need an ICD. So um, uh, it was a, came out as a maybe appropriate indication. The next clinical scenario is of a 65 years old, year old gentleman who is known ischemic. He underwent coronary artery bypass grafting seven years ago. He presented with congestive heart failure. He was controlled on medical treatment, his ejection fraction, was 26%. And what would be your management? So this is a classic primary prevention indication for a, a patient who is ischemic and has ischemic cardiomyopathy. So would you repeat the echo in three months or would you implant an ICD? There is no acute event and there is only heart failure. And the, the pivotal thing is that this patient has been on medical treatment. If he has been on medical treatment, the least among guidelines is three months, he would be a classic indication for implanting an ICD. So post-MI with ischemic cardiomyopathy and no recent PCI or cabbage, um, if the ejection fraction is low, everybody agrees 
that um, it's an indication for pacing provided that it's a NIHA class one, two, or three. The indication comes down to maybe appropriate if this patient has a stage four heart failure. Thirty-two years old athlete, gentleman with no risk factors of coronary artery disease. He presented with exertional shortness of breath of one month's duration that followed a bad call. His ejection fraction was found to, to be 26%. He was started on gradual increasing doses of ACI and beta blockers. And the question is, what would you do next? Reassure, repeat the echo after three months or put in an ICD. So that the, this is the point that we were talking about here is that when you have new onset of heart failure, you need to keep your patient on medical treatment for at least three months. And then if his ejection fraction remains impaired, you consider putting in the ICD. I think it's different among guidelines. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, are they completely at risk, uh, at, at, at low risk after the six months? Do they have a full protection? Again, the actually MRI may be a useful tool in this, in this population because we end up with uh, you know, scarring. So, myocarditis, viral myocarditis, as you are seeing now with, with COVID, COVID myocarditis can lead to. Scar. You, you had documented the myopathy with, uh, with the, the, scar. So the risk is not zero. I've thought about this, uh, to be honest. I would like to share with you my thoughts. I think we wait for the possibility that this is a myocarditis that will recover. Um, a, a less uh, important issue is the improvement that comes out of the medications. Because, uh, well, uh, um, interest to aside, um, the increase in ejection fraction with the standard medications um, in a patient with an ejection fraction of 20 or 25 would not get him out of the guideline indication for an ICD. So what do you think? I think you never know. I think you've seen, and I've seen, and everybody has seen people with very low EFs, really remarkably improved. It was part of patients in particular improved very nicely on optimal therapy. Uh, it was uh, viral uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, sometimes improved very nicely as well. So you have to give them that chance. I don't think we had a good two risks that we find them. Uh, I think it's still appropriate to give them a waiting period of three to six months and see how they improve. You would be surprised. I've been surprised. Yeah, it's just that uh, I guess if also the onset of symptoms would uh, come into play, like if this patient has been complaining um, years ago of manifestations of heart failure and he hasn't been started on medications except for, you know, three months or so, the chance of, of a, this patient recovering is different from the chance of a patient who, is, who developed his symptoms like four or five months ago. Yeah. So this is a 40 years ago. Question, why is the uh, rest of side is it still very expensive here? No, I, no, I meant because it, it really causes <laughs> remarkable improvement yeah. in the direction fraction. Yeah. But it's available. It is available, yeah. So this is a 40 years old lady who presented with dry cough, painful papules overlying the shin of tibia. Her chest X-ray showed higher lymphadenopathy. Her echo showed an ejection fraction of 40%. What would be the most likely etiology for her impairment of ejection fraction? So, what do you think this clinical scenario is going to? It's a classic clinical scenario of sarcoidosis. Yeah. So, uh, what's what? What would you recommend next for a patient like this? An MRI. Okay. So, her MRI showed patchy myocarditis, suggestive of cardiac sarcoidosis. And despite improvement of her symptoms with the initiation of medical treatment, her ejection fraction remained persistently impaired, but in, in the same range, like 40%. What would you do? Would you reassure or would you put in an ICD? Yeah. 
Uh, there is comments in the chat. Well, I, I guess that's the point, yes. Uh, there are certain diseases where the risk of sudden cardiac death is remarkably high, and you might not adhere to the 35 percent cut off uh, of the left ventricular ejection fraction. So among these uh, is sarcoid heart disease. It's notorious for causing ventricular arrhythmias, particularly if you know that this patient already has cardiac infection uh, in the form of patchy myocarditis. So I think I, I'm having the last case. In that case, sometimes uh, I, I throw out that an MPT study for visibility may be useful if the EF is not that low. Uh, if the EF is less than 35%, you have already an indication. Okay. Uh, yeah. But if it's borderline and you're worried or you're seeing unsustained VT, I think you know, it might be an added tool to use. So this patient is a 40-year-old gentleman who presented for routine checkup. He's asymptomatic, his echo is normal, his family history is irrelevant, and his ECG is shown below. And the question is again about putting in an ICD or reassurance. Doctor, here I have ECG. <laughs> okay. So what, what, what is funny here? بس ليه 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 بس؟ اه يا عيان عنده سينكوب وجايب الاي سي جي باترن ده ما عندوش سينكوب؟ اه اوكي اسيمتوماتيك سوري بس ستيل ذاتس ان اي سي جي اوف بروجيدا سينكوب رايت؟ داون سلوبينج اس تي اليفيشن ان ليد بي 1 ان ليد في 2 اتس ذا سادل شيب ذاتس كاركترستيك فور فور تايب 2 رايت؟ بس بس ذيس از بريتي دايجنوستيك اند يو سي هير ان اي دي ار از ويل Because EVR and uh, and lead one kind of uh, look at the same sort of area. So uh, what would you do for this patient? What would you do for this patient? This is an asymptomatic patient. Mm -hmm. Just you know have type one progeta syndrome in his electrocardiogram. <laughs> Okay, so that's a controversial area. What do you think of the Prosmon? Uh, it has been debated back and forth. The role of uh, the testing in Bulgaria is very interesting as well. Do we still have to look at, uh, at uh, no family issue of early surgery? He's made a few reports in the not symptomatic. He has the gene, he hasn't caused him any problems. Um, it's not an indication as it stands today. Okay, does he compete in sports and stuff like that? Sorry? And he allows to do competitive sports or fly or? No, I think you, you, you will be avoiding uh, a lot of the very strenuous, uh, stressful things. But that, what's, what are the triggers for uh, for VTDF in these patients? What are the common triggers? Huh? Even it's absolutely a good So I, I don't know that with no symptoms and no documented areas. Um, as it stands, with the economics of what we have, we don't have any indication for the devices. If you have a strong family history, um, I do sometimes these studies on those patients, just for reassurance purposes, because I think it's, it helps, you know, at least you've done all due diligence. And if they're not inducible, then uh, one thing that we frequently ask the, this group of patients is what is their occupation? If they are uh, 
doing a high risk occupation, like if he's a pilot or if he's a truck driver or something responsible for the life of others, probably this will make you lean forward to more uh, to, uh, to implanting an ICD. So uh, again, if this patient didn't have an EP study, it's rarely indicated. If he happened to have an EP study, because we mentioned that uh, EP study is, uh, is controversial in this group of patients, because um, some people would do it for risk stratification. Uh, and if you turn out to have a VT or a VF with an EP study, it's, it's inappropriate to put in an ICD, particularly if this ventricular arrhythmia is induced with sort of non-aggressive stimulation. If you get VT or VF with a single extra stimulus or a double extra stimulus, that makes you think that this patient um, might be at risk. Uh, this is going in line uh, with the fact that it turns out that this group of patients do, does, do have uh, slow potentials in their right ventricular outflow tracts and uh, so, so in the cardially and epicardially. So it, probably this might turn out to be sort of a structural heart disease rather than pure channelopathy as we uh, were thinking previously. Um, the last uh, indication that I will go through without even um, a clinical scenario is uh, battery change. What would you do if you have um, a patient who had an, uh, an implant for primary prevention, it has been there for years, and your patient never developed ventricular arrhythmia, uh, and it's due for his battery change. Would you change his battery or, or not? Um, so as per this publication, um, you, you need to look at the ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction is less than 35%. Most people would think that this is appropriate to go ahead and change uh, the battery with an ICD. But if it's higher than this, whether it's totally normal or in the sort of the mid range, uh, it's a maybe appropriate uh, indication. So some would leave, some would uh, leave him. What, what would you do in your practice, Dr. Osman? Uh, it's, uh, in most cases, we replace with stimulation. Right. Uh, there are cases where, like, depending on the patient, uh, condition, comorbidity, age, we opt to, uh, to downgrade uh, if there is a pacing indication. And, uh, if it, uh, and we always look at it, we look at all the history of the therapies, if there's any therapies or not, so that uh, uh, some patients actually want to have a look at our perhaps if there's nothing, so the pacing indicator is the end of the It's individualized. But, yeah. Yeah. If there is somebody who has, uh, I work from a high office room, and um, has uh, any uh, uh, particular arrhythmias, we actually have that discussion with the patient. Yeah. And we let them share the decision on continuing uh, with primary prevention. And the MRI would be great. Who's the MRI the champion? Somebody was really for that. I think an MRI would be great. Yes, Carl, and, and he has not a yet as it moves. I would probably want to have it myself. Yeah. All right. So uh, our practice, uh, taking all what you said in mind, for the most part, we go ahead and change the device uh, because you, you know that there is. I guess it's more abroad than here. There is a medically legal aspect as well. So you never know what's, uh, what's going to happen. So if, if the indication persisted, we probably put in the, the same device. All right. Uh, any questions either from here in, on the floor or uh, from uh, Zoom? If not, I would uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation. Thank you.